Welcome to Wild Turkey Science, a podcast made possible by Turkeys for Tomorrow. I'm Dr. Marcus Lashley, Professor of Wildlife Ecology at the University of Florida. And I'm Dr. Will Goolsby, Professor of Wildlife Ecology and Management at Auburn University. We're both lifelong hunters and devoted scientists who are passionate about hunting, managing, and researching wild turkeys. In this podcast, we'll explore turkey research, speak to the experts in the field, and address the difficult questions related to wild turkey ecology and management. Our goal is to serve as your connection to to wild turkey turkey science. (laughs) Are you going to start us off? Yeah, I'm going to start with you laughing because I feel like lately every episode we turn on, I'm laughing. Like that's when, yeah. that's when Charlotte cuts it in. Well, I think people appreciate that we're having fun. We're jovial. Jovial. We're a couple Can jolly old that? fellers. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? We're a couple of rednecks trying to do science. <laughs> what one of our ratings said. <laughs> I, I remember uh, my advisor in grad school always called himself an overeducated redneck. Yeah, <laughs> pretty accurate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, we're back. Indeed. Had a good long weekend. We did. Did you happen to see that, uh, coincidentally, I posted some stuff about coyote scat this weekend? Oh, I didn't see it. No, I was, I was off social all weekend. Yeah, well, I I was out doing some food plotting. Getting yeah. prepped anyway. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I found a coyote scat, and I immediately could see that it was a ball of hair and bones and stuff, uh-huh. and it had a bunch of little hooves in it. Mm. Phone hooves. So I did a post about the phone hooves. Yeah. Uh, how many did it have in it? How many hooves? Yeah. Three. Okay. So it wasn't more than one phone. No, as far or as I may, can tell. I it guess lo- it, we can't rule that out. Yeah, it looked like it was just one phone. Yeah. And honestly, I think that uh, that it threw up. I don't, I don't, <laughs> the I don't way think you it got it all that. down. <laughs> the way you phrased that. <laughs> well, I was trying to think of what's the best way to say this publicly <laughs> on the air. <laughs> was, yeah. You can tell we have young kids. <laughs> the yeah. way it's calling it throw it up. <laughs> Well, I showed my kids the the hooves. They were fascinated. My brother's yeah. kids as how well. Did they, how did they react to it? They thought it was awesome. Did they think it was sad at all? No. The my mother and I feel and like that's how my da- my it. daughter immediately she has that that strong sense of justice, and yeah. I've shown her things like that before, and she's like, "Dad, we need to get out the traps." <laughs> well, you it's know, not, it's not fair that these predators are eating these babies. I guess I've. I've uh, had a different kind of influence on mine because, like, I don't know if you've ever read the book. It's like uh, The Hen and the Fox or something Mm -hmm. like that. But the fox raids the hen house and eats one of the hens. And Mm -hmm. uh, I can remember her saying it now, my oldest. She said something, well, the fox has got to eat too. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I teach mine the same thing. They, they They have to eat too. And I even wrote that on the post that I did. Yeah, you know, the coyotes gotta eat too. I've walked, I've walked my daughter through that process as well, and thought, of, told her, I was like, yeah, it's sad that the fawn got eaten, but think about the coyote pups back at the den. Yeah, how many people do you think just turned this off after we said that? <laughs> <laughs> well, they may be wondering where are we going with this. Yeah, well, how, how, <laughs> well, how did it, how did it make you feel when you saw those hooves in there? I thought it was really cool. Just fascinated. Not- yeah, I think I would. I'm I'm more fascinated by that stuff than anything. Yeah, I was I was immediately wanting to dig around and see what. Yeah. You know what everything looked like. Yeah. And I was I thought it was remarkable. One of the hooves was almost completely intact. Yeah. I'll be honest too. I have a very different reaction when I see deer remains in a coyote scat compared to turkey remains in a coyote scat. Yeah. When I found, no, nah, that's not true. I found a. a turkey toe pad in it mm-hmm. and actually it was the first reason i did a deep dive on coyote stuff mm-hmm. yeah uh, i remember that, that post years ago yeah because i was turkey hunting and i found a turkey toenail sticking mm-hmm. up and right found, ended up finding and i 
did not feel bad about that either. It was more like, I cannot believe I've just found this. Yeah. It doesn't make me feel bad in the sense that I immediately feel the need to go out and do something about it, like I was alluding to earlier, but it does, it it concerns me more so from the perspective of, you know, we probably have too, more deer than we really need in most places, but that's not the case with turkey. Yeah, no one says they have too many turkeys unless <laughs> right. they are trying to grow some right. crops or something. You know? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I, but that's not, I mean, a lot of people, that's how they feel, though. When they see that, they're like, I have to do something about this. Yeah, like that That just can't happen. Right. Well, you know, uh, I got really intrigued about that, and, and I've gotten a number of questions over the years, and we still get a few uh, people asking us, for example, which part of the predator community should we be targeting if we're going to, you know, initiate trapping, you know, those kinds of questions. So I thought it'd be fun for us to go back to coyotes and do a deep dive specifically on them. Because, you know, I would say early as a biologist, I kind of had this perception that coyotes weren't eating that many turkeys right same like you know they can fly away their their vision is so good you know maybe a hen on the nest through the night occasionally but you know they're in places where coyotes don't hunt well you know i kind of had that that vision of it and that has my my position i guess has changed somewhat over time yeah like i think the coyotes are probably eating more turkeys than i thought yeah, yeah, I think so. So, how do you want to start this thing? Well, what did you come up with? Well, I guess that everybody out there, you probably have already put it together. I did the deep dive on this one. Dr. Goolsby did the deep dive last, what, a couple of weeks ago, whenever the yeah. episode on food plots was. We're, y'all should be proud of us. We, we We actually have set aside some days to record multiple episodes, so we're getting ahead of yeah. this thing now. Yeah. And we're we're also we're also in doing that, trying to not just have some episodes where we talk about things, but have some deep dive episodes, which I think has been one of the r- really unique things about the podcast. Yeah, because you know that that's pretty rare. That that's kind of our niche. Yeah, we're so we we want to keep that rolled in, and and I think the audience is enjoying it based on the feedback we get about it. And uh, But we also have lined up some people mm-hmm. to talk about some really interesting topics. And, uh, you know, I think we're, we're probably going to try to get a few updates here soon. So keeping the gamut of content coming. Mm-hmm. Diversified. This time I, I went through the literature and I, I did that in several ways. But I was trying to look for things related to coyotes and turkeys. So um, I would guess that the literature on this topic is increasing over the past five years compared to prior to that. I would say that's probably accurate. Okay. There has been a strong interest in coyotes, however, for a while. Right. Not as much focused on turkeys, but I think the relevant the things relevant to turkeys is changing more recently and some of that is coming with advancements and techniques Mm -hmm. yeah i know there's some old um data from texas for example on coyotes and turkeys yeah and i have i've dug up some of that yeah and part of it too is the literature from east of the mississippi um is kind of sparse because we haven't had them here that long yeah so we haven't had long to study them in some place in the North Carolina, out in the east part of North Carolina, it was in the 90s, I think, when they started mm-hmm. showing up. Yeah. It's just really recent there. Yeah, and I've been out of the coyote literature for a while, but when I was in it, I do remember um, there was still some talk that was floating around about, like, even up in, like, North Carolina and Virginia, that that landscape still was not saturated with coyotes, mm-hmm. you know, 15, 20 years ago. I don't know if it has, if it's become so since, um, I definitely get the sense that we, that we're saturated now in like Louisiana, Mississippi, you know, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, I, for sure. I don't know if 
saturated is the right word, but they're definitely ubiquitous. Well, I feel like the land, I guess what I mean by that to be a little bit more explicit is I feel like in most parts of Alabama, coyotes are probably already around carrying capacity. Yeah. Like, I mean, maybe the landscape could support more, uh, a few more here and there, but I, I think that they're, they're more naturalized here. Yeah. Um, as opposed to being in a, like an early invasion phase. Yeah. Well, I actually have, uh, the best resource available uh, on this specific thing, like when did coyotes show up and where. Mm -hmm. I have a range map that Perfect. was put together. Uh, it was it's covering from 1900 all the way to 2016, right before it was published. This was yeah. led by Roland Case, who was right. a he is uh, a professor at NC State and also dual dual position with the North Carolina Museum there. North Carolina Museum of, is it natural history or? I don't know the full name of it. I'd have anyway. to look it up. But uh, yeah, he he was also on my PhD committee. Mm -hmm. So I, I did a lot of work with coyotes, deer, and turkeys at the same right. time. And uh, he was involved in that. But they... They basically reconstructed the range expansion based on a whole bunch of data sets. And they were like specimens and photographs and reports from state agencies and uh, all kinds of things like that. Yeah. I know cool. to, to give the listeners context, I do know um, from the time that I spent working intensively on, on coyote science <laughs> <laughs> as opposed to turkey science. Um, and I was mostly researching coyotes from a, their interaction with deer perspective. But um, I remember back then at the time, the this is a very needed paper is the point that I'm trying to make yeah. because <laughs> could have just we, had, that. we had very coarse timelines. It was like, oh, well, they, you know, they kind of split and they, they expanded on these yeah. two fronts, one to the north and one to the south. And they started showing up in this state around this decade. It was very coarse. Yeah. Well, we had, you know, at... I was running into the same problem, mm -hmm. uh, but we had a, a unique situation where we knew the first coyote that was detected when that was on Fort yeah. Bragg, where my, my PhD research was. It was in 1989, I believe. Yeah. Like they had the observation that confirmed right. first coyote on the base, which was right around 1990. But I, my guess would be that that population expanded quite a bit from from then to now um yeah, and absolutely. so like when that first sighting occurred that was extremely rare and there was probably not another sighting for quite a while yeah I, they they have pretty good information on it there actually and it it was kind of an exponential growth curve you know took two or three years to really get going mm -hmm. and then by 10 to 12 years later you know right there in the early 2000s there were a lot of them then mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's how, so, that's how it was. The t I mean, that timeline I think is pretty applicable for most States along the Atlantic, right? Yeah. That, that was probably the latest timeline. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's kind of weird. So I, I can just describe this map. And if you're watching on YouTube, we'll, we'll cut it in as figure three from K this case at all paper. And it's color coded based on the range expansion. But if you look at the red color, that says of 1900. And the range was really constricted compared to now. In fact, uh, they were basically going into East Texas and they were not yet in Louisiana. They were over most of Oklahoma and Missouri all the way up to southern Wisconsin, it looks like. And they extended into Canada, especially in western Canada, up all the way almost to Alaska mm -hmm. in 1900. Of course, they extended down through Mexico all the way down to, like, uh, the Yucatan. Yeah, that's what I was going to say is I'm looking at that figure now, and it's really wild how much ground they cover. And you think yeah, about, so you think about the climate. Yeah, you think about the climate and the ecosystem and yeah, how much the, variability there is from the Yucatan Peninsula all the way up to 
you know, almost yeah, into t- Alaska. Yeah, we're we're talking about almost to the equator, from the equator to the Arctic Circle. Pretty That's incredible. Insane. Yeah. So, you know, that range started expanding pretty quickly. By the 60s, they were, you know, in, into Alabama and, and southern Georgia and looks like even into, you know, the panhandle of Florida down into maybe central Florida. Mm-hmm. But you can see most of the the eastern seaboard still they they're not present. And one of the things I found really interesting, and I think there is a follow up paper, although I didn't go dig it up from Kay's lab, mm-hmm. that looked at genetics. And you can kind of see going north of the Great Lakes, they come around down into the eastern seaboard and sort of start coming south. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can sort of see it in the timeline. Well, so they were basically diverging around the Great Lakes and then coming back together. And that, I think, based on the genetics work, yeah. is why the Carolinas were, or especially North Carolina, was the last because it was like the northern and southern ranges converging. Back. Yeah, yeah. The so, latest uh, area to be colonized, for those of you that aren't looking at the figure, was, I mean, it's like a oval that you know is 50 50 split between virginia and north carolina yeah and that was in 2000 the the late 2000s up into uh, the blue color yeah that's up in the extreme northeast part of the range so that was in the 2000s yeah when they colonized right there in the the piedmont of Mm -hmm. north carolina so really interesting you know just kind of looking at that timeline but in You know, most, pretty much uh, east of the Mississippi. Yeah. We're talking about 60s, 70s before they were colonizing most areas. Yeah, and on an ecological time scale, that's like last week. Yeah, like it (laughs) basically just happened. Yeah. So so what is is the potential unique challenge posed by having a large predator – arrive somewhere where there's pre- prey species that are completely naive to it. What do you mean? I mean, do we have, or is there any of other examples of how that's played out and it is it different than a typical predator prey dynamic? Do we know anything about that? I mean, yeah, I mean, it, I think it stands to reason that, you know, if you've got a Turkey population in, let's just use North Carolina as the example, cause we've been talking about North Carolina and Virginia for a while. And um, you've got turkey populations there, and then they've never been exposed to coyotes. And now all of a sudden, there's this predator taking large numbers of of individuals from that population. And I have no experience watching out for that predator. Um, yeah, uh, so you would t- think they would be more effective when they first arrive yeah. somewhere. Typically, that's the pattern that you see across most novel species interactions like so that. Is, so is Up that... Front, what, basically, you kind of have this... Once the predator colonizes, you go through this period of time where right. essentially the population is growing to a level that could be problematic, I guess, for the yeah. prey species. And then you kind of, w- once you get to some critical mass of predators, then you would typically go through this period of time where their their impact on prey is heightened mm-hmm. because it, they're naive to it. Mm-hmm. And it, you know... We see so that is populations well essentially adapt. Yeah, no, there are a lot of good studies on this with smaller species on islands in particular. Yeah, and in in island situations, uh, in some cases it could cause extinction, but that's mm-hmm. pretty rare in in uh, you know continental scale things like this. Like we're well, they're not going to cause turkeys to go extinct. In other words, yeah. like that that would be exceptionally rare for that kind of stuff to happen with a predator expansion. Yeah, and the other thing to think about in this in this particular scenario too is it's not like there's a learning. I mean, I guess there wouldn't be a learning phase for the coyote because I mean, obviously they've been in Texas forever. There's turkeys yeah. in Texas. Now the the environments that they're pursuing turkeys in are going to be different you know, in South Texas compared to Virginia, but they're not completely naive to the prey base. That's right. 
whereas the turkey is completely naive to the predator, right? Yes. Uh, well, sort of. They're completely naive to this predator. To that predator. That's one thing I think, you know, we probably would not see that pattern that I just described here because when when we're talking about like a feral cats getting released on an island, the mm -hmm. prey on that island are naive to any kind of predator like that. Like, if, you know, New yeah. Zealand, there aren't yeah. even mammal predators. Yeah, so they're not even being vigilant whatsoever. Right. That's a completely different situation, whereas coyotes are very similar to some of the historical predators, particularly yeah. red wolves. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and the turkeys are not completely naive to predation. I mean, everything wants to eat a turkey, right? They're not just... Right. That, that's very different than, than being on an island that never had any predators. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I'm just trying to th trying to think through right now, like all the major predators, especially of adult turkeys right now is what I'm thinking about. Mm -hmm. And how they, like how their hunting strategy might differ from those of coyotes and how that might, you know, put in this dynamic one or the other species involved in it at a disadvantage or an advantage. Like, mm -hmm. How different, for instance, is the way a coyote hunts compared to the way that a gray fox hunts? Um, or how different is a coyote from a bobcat that's more of an ambush predator? I don't mm -hmm. know. I mean, so turkeys have been exposed to certain aspects of coyote hunting behavior, but not all of them. Right. Well, and, you know, that's kind of what happens here. It's not you, you basically, the predator-prey population, then that dynamic reaches a different e equilibrium, right? Like, And there's lots of factors that could play into that, like the relative abundance of the predator and the prey, the how plastic is the diet of the predator, mm -hmm. you know, novel behaviors that might be associated with their interactions. Right. But, you know, but basically, that's what you would expect is you would reach some equilibrium at some point. Yeah. In their populations, not that the it's completely one, stable, it would fluctuate, but you know you'd have some sort of equilibrium where where you'd eventually stabilize, yeah, tell me if you can think of a relevant counterexample, but I cannot think of another turkey predator that hunts cooperatively like coyotes would, because you know I think about you know some of these photos that people send us of um turkeys you know catching and killing a turkey or uh, coyotes catching and killing a turkey in a food plot right and a lot of times there's more than one coyote there in those images like they're hunting as a mm -hmm. you know a pair or maybe even a group of three that would be unique for sure yeah it certainly could be one thing i, I found interesting you always hear about the pack of coyotes that killed the deer or whatever you know right in our work on fort bragg we were genotyping turkeys and deer and anything basically that got eaten. Uh, we had fox squirrels. I don't remember if we genotyped any of their mortalities, but mm -hmm. we never detected more than one coyote at a kill site. Oh, really? Yeah. Interesting. That doesn't mean it never happened, but yeah. uh, we, yeah, we only detected one in every case that we were able to detect coyote at the kill. That's really interesting. So that kind of made us wonder how much are they actually cooperating. Now, with that same those same data, we had many, or shouldn't say many, we had some pairs where they were clearly a male and female that were paired, mm -hmm. and they were moving around, you know, in synchrony, basically. Mm -hmm. They didn't stay together all the time. Right, yeah. But... They were together a lot. Yeah, that's my experience with mated pairs, too. I've caught a few mated pairs mm -hmm. and seen that same trend. So I could see it, you know, when they had pups that are getting a little older and start running well around with them, yeah. they might have a, you know, a slightly larger group size. But I suspect most of the time it's a pair. Well, one like of the things farm. that I was curious about, and um, y'all probably address this, but I wonder, you know, if, if coyotes share a... A, a prey item more often with other individuals are more closely related to like, did y'all have the genetic resolution to differentiate like siblings and parents from offspring and things like that? Um, 
I think we did. I'm asking you to recall some really specific details <laughs> from a study that was that t- 15 years ago. Yeah, 15 years ago. <laughs> and Chitwood was the one leading all the genetics work. So I bet Chitwood even... knows the answer to this. Oh, he would know. He remembers exactly how many samples. Yeah. yeah. Chitwood, if you're washing dishes right now, <laughs> let us know how many individuals it was, and I'll put it back on there. <laughs> yeah, he'd be like, oh, yeah, there was this mated pair, and I remember it was a Tuesday. And <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, he, tell, he tells me relatively often that he listens to the show often while he's washing dishes. With, <laughs> you know, the evening, so that's why I gave that reference. There's uh, nothing else to do. Might as well listen to Will and Marcus. <laughs> well, I'm suffering already, so we may well, as well just continue. Like this when he just Coulter, like puts all the all the the suffering in in one place. Coulter, if you're listening, go leave us a review right now <laughs> and say this is at least better than washing dishes. <laughs> We're more inter- more entertaining than washing dishes. That's all you have to say. Yeah. <laughs> So, you want to continue on with this? Yes. Okay, well, uh, yeah, we've established, I think, the timeline for coyotes, and a lot of people might just find that itself Mm -hmm. interesting, but I got really curious when I found that toe pad in toenail, you know, in that scat a couple of years ago. So, I, I started looking through the literature, really curious about it, just trying to gather information because I... When I saw it, you know, like I said, I, it's, it was sort of striking to me. I was like, man, how, how many turkeys are coyotes eating? Mm-hmm. So I started looking in the literature to see what I could find. Uh, the majority of studies are, are diet related. And, that, and this is actually relevant to something I said earlier where there are some more specific studies here recently that that look in the diet of coyotes and how what percentage or what frequency the, a turkey shows up in it. Mm-hmm. But historically, we didn't have the same technology, and they usually would lump them with other birds. Yeah, you would just see like avian in a percentage. Yeah. So I, I have dug up quite a few studies, you know, just looking at diet in general. Mm -hmm. There was one, it's a a thesis, which we'll we'll put all these in the show notes. Uh, I also have a post on Facebook that has them all linked in it. Uh, Maybe we'll reshare that through our our Dear Lab page. Uh, So Melville 2012 is a Pretty small sample size, but that was in Texas. They did not find any evidence of turkeys in in 16 samples that they processed, so small sample size. There was a study in South Carolina that was larger. That, that was uh, in the early 2000s. They looked at over 400 samples, and they found the most common thing in the diet was soft mast. Mm-hmm. which I can relate to. In fact, that's an interesting sidebar just itself. Yeah. Co- like every going. coyote scat has persimmons in it. Yeah. I don't understand, even if it's May. Persimmons, muscadines, blackberries, and pears. Or yeah. what I've seen coyote and or what I've seen coyotes eat more than anything. I mean, I've had scats that are entirely comprised of the seeds of all four of those species. Yeah. Like there's nothing else in it. They're just eating yeah. fruit. Yep. But I agree with you. You see it during times of the year where you wouldn't expect to. Yeah, like where, why is there persimmons in, in there in May? <laughs> I don't it's know. like as far away from the persimmon <laughs> masting season as you could get. I don't know. Those <laughs> bastards are damn good at finding. We, I think we had this discussion when at you were finding talking. finding persimmons. I wish I was as good at it. <laughs> you know, in that episode where you told everybody that you genotyped a human? Yeah. Scat. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Uh, I, it, one of those episodes, I that, think we've the had show this has just gone before. downhill from he, from there, right? It <laughs> peaked that day. Yeah, that's the most memorable moment. <laughs> like when you found the glove, <laughs> that, the purple glove in the scout. Apparently, that and uh, <laughs> when I trans translated things into how they compared to the state of Alabama. Yeah, and then the show's gone downhill. 
Yep, yeah, those were the two key moments. So in the in that Shrek and Goss paper, they they were one of them that did what I was just saying. They did not distinguish between turkeys and other birds, but depending on uh, the month they were looking in, the birds comprise somewhere between zero and eighteen percent of mm. the diet, uh, based on how they calculate it. I don't. I did not make notes on whether it was frequency or proportion, but yeah, uh, usually I did write the word proportion, so I'm assuming they did proportion in this one. Um, but usually they give pretty similar results, and they usually re- uh, put both in the paper. So we know it's not more than 18% in any given month, but it was curious that spring was the highest proportion. So Mm -hmm. that's when they were up on the upper end of that paper from uh, from South Dakota. So I'm I'm trying to give you kind of a smattering across the the range. McCracken and Urish in the early 1980s. In South Dakota, estimated that two percent of the coyote diet was turkey. Okay. So, uh, one of our friends and one of your lab mates, Mike Cherry, did a study. There was uh, over six hundred samples, six hundred seventy-three samples in Georgia, and they also did not distinguish turkey from other birds but it ranged between 9 and 16% of the diet was bird so mm-hmm. we at least know it wasn't more of the diet than that right yeah uh there was one from florida which i was somewhat surprised i wasn't expecting to find a florida one but grigion uh 2011 Gr- grigion grigion I don't know. Work through are. it. Don't get hurt, though. <laughs> so they had 120. Again, uh, did not distinguish turkeys, but 11% of the diet was bird. Mm. Did you find Kelly at all? Oh. As you were going through those, it just made me think of that. Um, James Kelly did his food habit study in, in Georgia. Um, that would have been back in the mid two thousands around that was published around 08, 10, somewhere 10 or 12, 10 or 11. You know, what would be phenomenal. There's so many studies like this Mm -hmm. over the years. It'd be awesome to go back and look at over a timeline. How has coyote diet changed? Yes. Cause there are several studies from some States. Yeah. Right. And you can just see how, how has that changed over time? So we didn't, in that study, or we didn't it? distinguish turkeys from other birds either. Um, Which study? In, in the Kelly at all. That was James Kelly's oh, okay. master's research. Um, but we had one site that we found up to 20% um, of scats contained bird remains. And that was particularly... That was in your, your work? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was in central Georgia. Um, and that was that happened to be during March and April, too. Yeah. And what was really Which is in- coincidental, you know. Yeah. First of all, there should be lots of carcasses from yes. hunters. Yes. So there should be some scavenging occurring. Yeah, there could be. Uh, there also, during breeding, and we would expect the male to be most vulnerable during that time, and the female, absolutely, while she's sitting on mm-hmm. the nest. Yeah. So, and, and brooding, I guess. They're also commonly lost then as well. Yeah, because they won't they won't flush. They'll try to stay around their poults. But yeah. what was really interesting about that is during March and April, we had one site where birds were were found in twenty percent of scats. But on the other site that was just a few miles down the road, they were only found in about four percent of scats. And I don't have data on this, but anecdotally, every time that I turkey hunted when I was working on those sites, I would hunt on the site that where they were found in twenty percent of scats. So to me, um, that percentage may be indicative of the difference in turkey abundance between the two sites. So they're showing up in the scat when they're more available to show up in the scat. Yeah, they're they're showing up in the scat at five think, five times the rate on the site that had a better huntable population. At least from well, that, a hunter's that's perspective. That's another important point. You know, instinctually I think most people would would be 
would think of that a very different way. They would think, right. oh, wow, when 20% of the scats have it, that means they're really crushing the turkey population. Yeah. But it's actually this more worth it for coyote state turkeys when there's a lot of them. Yeah, and that's something that I think is interesting, too, that may be worth talking about for a minute if you want to. But coyotes are such a generalist predator that they can divert, you know, their, their diet is very diverse. And so yeah. they don't become too dependent on any particular food item, which is a good thing in the sense that if you're a turkey manager, they're not a turkey specialist predator. And we, well, we can talk more about that in just a second. But on the flip side, the downside of it is that if your turkey population goes down, your predator population, or at least in terms of coyotes, doesn't necessarily track that because they just switch to eating other prey. Yeah. That's, that's one way to look at it. Another thing that I was going to say you know, some of the alternative foods are also associated with higher quality turkey habitat. That's a good point, too. So, for example, we were talking about earlier, you know what? Even in my current stature, I'm not a very fast person. I might be, you know, uh, faster than you think, so don't <laughs> grin and snicker. But I, I can still catch berries. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm fast enough to catch berries. Like they're really easy to catch. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like if you're managing your property such that there's fruit everywhere, yeah. There are literally dozens of studies and all of them find fruit as one of the major components. Yeah. Right. And and uh you know what another one is that I would not have thought what's another major food item? That's usually in the top, especially during the summer. Insects. Insects. They eat the heck out of them. Now, I can't catch a grasshopper as as well as I used to. Yeah. Uh, But it's a lot easier than a rabbit. Yeah. I can catch it before I can catch a rabbit. You're right. But my point is, if you're managing the landscape such that those things are really abundant, it's sort of like the example you just gave. When turkeys are really abundant, it's more worth it for them to eat more of that well yeah when you got fruit everywhere and uh you know insects everywhere which are both important for turkeys you know you're providing an alternative that's much easier to catch Mm -hmm. so that's that's a good little sidebar for us i didn't think we'd get there yet but i'm glad we did yeah and i mean i guess taking that a step further if you want to keep talking about it i mean coyotes are typically drawn to early succession. Yeah. You know, a lot of their food items occur there. So some people might think, well, you know, I mean, obviously we always promote managing for early succession for Turkey's benefit on this podcast. But, um, just with that one piece of information, some people might conclude that, well, I don't want early succession on my property because I'm drawing in coyotes. But remember, you know, in ecology, things are never that, that simple. So yeah, sure. You may be drawing in more coyotes, but you're drawing them in because they have a greater prey base. You've expanded their prey base out. You know, with your work on coyotes, you just gave me a really interesting idea, and I wanted to ask you a question about it because mm-hmm. you may be familiar with it. With the work that's been done on coyote movement, mm-hmm. has anyone looked at the landscape composition mm-hmm. and whether or not that's influencing the establishment of a home range? Hmm. you know what i mean like yeah. if you have more early succession does that make it more likely that a coyote will establish a home range there because I, my instinct is no i don't know that it makes it more likely that it'll establish a home range there but we definitely have used resource selection function data to so to show that they that is a preferred and selected for yeah. cover type so you would see you within their home range they use that space more selectively yeah, yeah. But I don't know that at you know if you take a step up and you know the selection right in in terms of uh, scale. I I'm guessing they probably are filling in most of the space. That's there's not be gaps out there. in there's not gaps in the landscape where there's no coyote, like the you know the coyotes aren't using that space right. I mean, unless it's water or, or no, I think something. they're 
I mean, the intensity, there's definitely variation in the intensity of use across the landscape, yeah. but I think if what you're saying, I think you're right in the sense that almost a hundred percent of the landscape now has a coyote pass through it, at least on some relatively. Yeah. It's like within basis. their home range. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, I mean, I, I do see trends in properties just from trapping, you know, just using catch per unit effort as like an index of abundance. I do tend to see that properties that have major cor- travel corridors on them oftentimes are more fertile trapping grounds. And so like, um, you know, those like trans power line right ways um, major river corridors sometimes mm-hmm. places like that are, are generally where I see, you know, generally when I see properties having extreme densities compared to other places that I've seen, they meet that criteria. But, um, uh, that's an interesting dynamic. I don't think this is something that we want to get into today, but I think a lot of times on those properties, the functional density of coyotes probably isn't that much different than elsewhere because a lot of those individuals are transient. They're just moving mm-hmm. through because of the connectivity that it provides rather than sit, setting up shop there and making their living there. Right. If that makes sense. So you probably, you may have the same number of resident ones that establish yeah. a, a home range and defend that territory from others. And, but uh, some locations on the landscape have a higher effective density because the transients use it to move across the landscape. Yeah, I think so. That's interesting. And these are all, we should be very clear, This these are all just hypotheses right now. Yeah. I, mean, I haven't tested any of this stuff. We're just kind of yeah. working through our thoughts with y'all. <laughs> yeah, so let's see. I skipped the, uh, I'm trying to bounce around and give you some a smattering. Also, we'll, we'll link this post. There are, that I, that I'm going through, I made notes on all of these publications, and there's probably seriously over 20 links. So if you're interested in a particular part of the world that I didn't talk about, mm-hmm. good chance I have a paper link to it where you're at. Yeah, and um, to speak to what you talked about earlier too, I think this this is something that just popped into my mind that I think you'll be really interested in. But we, um, John Hickman, for his master's research, he was looking at. He was specifically looking at movements of female coyotes during the breeding season. So it would have been like late winter into early spring, obviously a period of interest uh, to turkey hunters and managers too. And when we were going through that data, I'm trying to think about, um, yeah, I think there were like 30% of the individuals that we tagged didn't have well established, didn't have home ranges. You know, about 70, 60, 70 percent of them did. Mm-hmm. Um, but there was a, one other metric I was going to bring up, and now, now, oh yeah, I remember what it was. So we had like I don't remember. It was in the somewhere in the neighborhood of the low teens, I think, in in numbers of females tagged on this property. And after the fact, um, we were particularly interested in the areas that they used and how intensively they used them during the fawning season because of the implications uh, for that intensity of use might have for the probability of coyotes encountering a fawn in that mm-hmm. area, right? And so we built these really cool 3D maps in ArcMap. And basically what it would do is it went around, um, it, it segmented the landscape out into these relatively small grid cells. I don't know how big we made them. I mean, they may have been like 100 yards by 100 yards or something like that. And then we just counted all the, all the GPS locations that, that occurred in those grid cells across the landscape. And then ArcMap allowed us to make like little like 3D mountain peaks that represented mm-hmm. the intensity of use of each of those grid cells. And it was really cool because once you pieced it all together from, I think it was like 13 or 14 females that we had tagged on this one property. And you see that it looks like mountains, right? Mm-hmm. And they all kind of fit together. If you color code them, you've got, you know, mountain A, B, C, D, and they're, they're not a Venn diagram. They don't overlap. So you yeah. have these different females and they're occupying the landscape. And then all of a sudden you'll see that there's this gap between these two, right? Yeah. You and others, all the, all the others are, didn't tag. exactly. All the others are butted up against each other. Yeah. And we never did this because we ran out of time in the study, but it would have been so cool in hindsight to go out and try to intensively trap those 
those holes, so yeah. to speak, in the landscape and see, like, was there a female occupying that space? And I think that that speaks to what you were bringing up earlier. There was likely a female using that area. It was just that we didn't catch her. Yeah. That's really interesting. So there, there, I think there's pretty good evidence that they're establishing a territory and defending it. And I yeah. remember uh, Dana Moore, and I, I think it was who was telling me about it, how her work in Virginia, the home ranges looked like donuts mm -hmm. where, you know, they weren't using it very intensively in the middle because they were at the boundaries defending it all the time. Yeah. So, and I, you know, I think that's relevant. I hear people talk about this all the time. Like if you remove coyotes, you know, if you remove one of those females that's defending her territory, mm -hmm. that opens the door for others potentially to move in. So from so, a deer perspective, we have no evidence that that occurs. Um, from there, what? From a deer perspective. I, of the coyote removal studies that have been done for, for fawns, right? Yeah. I have never seen one where they trapped coyotes and then they were able to show a decrease in survival or a decrease in recruitment after trapping. Okay? Like to me, to where it's worse than it was before they did right. anything. I should make that clear. To they've never I've never seen where trapping made it made the situation worse. Yeah. There's only one year in the South Carolina study that it that it was lower overall. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And then we found the same thing um in Georgia too, like if you want to get into that right now on the effects well, I, of removal. Yeah, I had a couple more studies I was going to... Yeah, let's go into that. Sorry, I, I've so, been <laughs> sidetracking. Well, no, it's fine. I think it's good conversation. So, the, I'm just, let me just glance down through here. I don't think there was a single study that would have been where 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 turkeys could have been more than about 15% or 18% maybe even been the highest for mm -hmm. that part of the, you know part of that study yeah uh where turkeys could have been more of the diet than that mm -hmm. so it's relatively low uh again we'll link this so you can look at all of these other studies I'm not going to go through every single one there was a more recent study that used more advanced techniques they were using i guess meta barcoding uh, genetic stuff to to identify things in coyote scat oh is that this, youngman yeah jordan youngman youngman et al and this was in south carolina and they had three sites and if you look at figure three from that study they show you the items that they found in that paper and they across the three sites they looked at the coyote diet and i found it pretty remarkable how similar they are like deer is 70 the frequency this doesn't mean 70 percent of their diet but mm -hmm. in 70 percent of the scats roughly across all three sites deer were in the scat yeah were detected Turkey was also remarkably similar across them, and it was about 10%, mm. 10% frequency. Mm -hmm. And they specifically took it to Turkey. It wasn't just yeah, bird. Yeah, it's wild turkey. Yep. Yeah. And uh, they lumped other avian, and the other avian looks like it's somewhere around 5%. Where are you frequency. looking at that? Because I'm on Scholar right now, and I typed in Youngman Coyote Food Habit and can't find it. Uh, it, it's actually some Patrick Meso predators because he did coyote, bobcat, and uh, fox. Got it. There it is. But he did not have near. He, the study was focused on coyote, so there wasn't yeah. a bit, very big sample size on the other ones. I think those were min misidentified scats that they did on accident. Okay. And then it came back, you know, for a different predator. Yeah, that was a big thing that that I realized. Um, during some of my dissertation work as well, is that it's really, really difficult to differentiate bobcat, I think, cat, I think we already got it. <laughs> bobcat, coyote, and fox cats from each other. And human um, occasionally. And human apparently occasionally anyway, <laughs> even though that was cross-contamination, Marcus is never going to quit laughing about it. But, oh, um, man. 
but yeah, like even if you if you use like, <laughs> I mean, you guys think you guys think that the research that I was involved in was bad. We literally, as wildlife biologists, there are publications out there that you can buy that will tell you the average length, diameter, and shape of every mammal's poop in North America and beyond. So <laughs> to say that I was a part of the shittiest work that has ever been done on scat would not be true. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So who who had to measure all of them? Can you imagine just sitting there <laughs> with it? <laughs> You're trying to man. This it, one's a giant turd. It's a curved. It's a curved scat. So you're you're out there with a string trying to make sure that you follow the contour. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so man. there are far worse things that you can have to do with scat than what I did. So. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Back to this. <laughs> yeah, this was a really cool study from young men and kind of you know, confirms that, well, I guess we could probably try to apply it to some of these other studies. A lot of the studies have about 10 or 15% bird. Yeah. You know, when they lumped them. Yeah. And based on this, probably somewhere between half and two thirds of that could be turkey, especially if it's concentrated in the spring. Yeah. Um, What's interesting? So, what figure are you? Have you looked at figure two? Are you looking? At yes, figure I two have. Right now? No, I'm um, looking at figure three. So, figure two is interesting because it shows the frequency of occurrence of different food items in bobcat, coyote, and gray fox scats. Yeah. And so, the frequency of occurrence means, um, oh gosh, I always get mixed the num- up on like, this. If you had ten scats, the number yeah, yeah. of them that had the item detected. That's right. That's right. Um, it's actually higher for gray fox than coyotes. Yeah, the one thing I would the uh, wild turkey po- the wild turkey portion of the diet anyway. Yeah, I think it's important to point out the sample size for gray foxes is much smaller. Okay, but I did note that that you know almost twenty percent of the scats they tested had turkey in them. Yeah, the gray fox scats, yeah. and then it was it was lower closer. for Bobcat. Yeah, it was the lowest for Bobcat. Yeah, only about 5%. And kind of between the two for Coyote. That's interesting. Yeah, I found that interesting as well. But I was trying to keep it focused on Coyotes here. You know. My bad. That's all good. So, you know, we've been talking about what Coyotes eat. What about from the turkey's perspective? You know, I thought that might be interesting to look at it from a different perspective. Yeah. There are some studies where coyotes are eating a fair amount of the turkeys. It's usually only a few percent, especially of adult males. But uh, there was one, Hoochin 2005. This is from Texas and Kansas, Rio Grande, 300 uh, 313 sample size of turkeys. 47% of their mortalities, so not 47% of the turkeys they tagged, mm-hmm. 47% of the ones that died, they associated with coyote. So they had 300-something turkeys? Yeah. I don't know what, I didn't write down what the mortality rate was. So yeah. we could work out what number of the 313 yeah. was it. Usually... You know, we're in this, let's say, 60% on average, 60-something percent survival rate. So maybe half of the 40%. So I'm trying to do math right here, folks. Um, you know how that goes. It's not very good. Uh, what's 10? Oh, boy. <laughs> Please don't cut this, Charlotte. <laughs> Let him work through. <laughs> you carry the one. <laughs> So what, uh, that's about 100 mortalities. Yeah, almost 100 mortalities. So maybe 40 to 50 for a coyote out of the 313. That's a lot. 
So that's my guessing. I, I don't know what their mortality rate was in that study. It could have been, okay. they could have had a 70 something percent annual survival or a 40 something percent. Yeah. I, I don't remember what it is. Yeah. But, you know, that was more than I suspected. And I think that was hens. Uh, th- there was a Mississippi study. This was one of our colleagues, Miller et al., 1999. It's a really cool study from Tallahala. And pr- predation was the leading cause of mortality. 46% of their mortalities were predation. Mm-hmm. And I did write it down on this one. They confirmed that coyotes were five of the 51 hens that got eaten. So about Five 10... of 51 that got eaten? Yeah. So less than 10% cost specific mortality. That's right. Um, so and overall, course, five, the overall five number. Out of 294. Five out of 300 turkeys, basically. Yeah. Got eaten by coyotes. So uh, none of those were males. Those were all hens, and they were... Uh, I wrote that nesting hens had higher risk, so it sounds like not all of them were on nest, but mm-hmm. some, yeah, you know, more more than than not. Uh, let's see. Well, there's another one from Ontario. <laughs> Nadzilski. That's what I'm gonna enough. go with. And Bowman, 2015, and they they had 53. Turkey's tag, predation by coyotes were the leasing cause of mortality for hens. Uh, 16 of 18 hens that were killed by a mammalian predator were coyote. So 16 out of 53. Okay. So that's more substantial. Yeah, for sure. That's worrisome. Yeah. Most of these studies, by the way, the low, the Predation risk and the survival rate generally is lower during the reproductive season, which I think we've mm-hmm. said sometime, but yeah. this is going through quite a few studies. That's very consistent. Um, so I just came across Table 3 in Youngman. Did you look at that? Um, I have, but I do not remember what's in it. Oh, well, what's interesting is they have... Um, so these are parameter estimates for the top models for turkey and deer consumption by coyotes in that study. Remember, this is the one from South Carolina. And um, it was really interesting. So there was nothing that was a significant predictor of turkey consumption. But for deer, the frequency of occurrence of turkey remains in scats had a negative effect on the amount of deer and scats if i'm interpreting this correctly and i just pulled they're negatively correlated yeah it looks like basically as turkeys eat more deer or as as turkeys eat more deer (laughs) (laughs) where where are you going with this wow (laughs) you need some more of that kool-aid coffee you made earlier (laughs) I think I may have just stumbled just re- on an idea. Let's just have the turkeys eat the coyotes. Problem <laughs> solved. Uh, that reference that I just made is because Will made his coffee with, with Gatorade this morning. It was not uh, in reference to some sort of illegal activity. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate you clarifying that. Although it probably should be illegal. To make coffee with Gatorade. <laughs> yeah, I can't think of a reason why it should be illegal because I don't think that's something that people want to do. <laughs> so if you ever, if you, if, if you ever question whether or not you should listen to me for advice, now everyone has the answer. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I normally, I normally mix up a, a tumbler of ice water every morning. And this morning, I felt like I needed some more electrolytes, so. I put a little bit of that powder in there and then I got to the office and poured some, what I thought was water from my tumbler into my coffee maker and it was Gatorade. So (laughs) rookie mistake. (laughs) So I don't know. I I just didn't know if you had looked at that table because I want to make sure that I'm interpreting it correctly without having read, you know. Yeah. So basically if, if coyotes are distracted by eating deer, they don't eat turkeys. Yeah. But it does. So does that mean that if I'm managing a property for turkeys, the more deer I have, the better? Probably not. 
<laughs> because the deer end well, up it, eating the plants that are preferred by turkeys too, th- right? We don't want what, that to happen either. This is where all the argument is really between people because we could have different interpretations and we don't actually have evidence to support or refute any of the interpretations. No. For example, it may be that uh, when habitat quality is better, you end up having more deer and turkeys and coyotes eat the deer because they prefer deer over. Yeah. Like it could be related to habitat. Well, there's so many explanations for this. And and maybe it's just that the coyotes in that area of South Carolina have specialized in deer. Yeah. That's a possibility too. I mean, you and I were talking and and y'all have to realize that some of this is just off the cuff, like us thinking yeah. through this. And there's tons right. of ways that you could explain that. And some of the reason we're doing this is just to give you examples. Yeah. Well, I think that's fun for people to hear us work through. Like, this is the kind of stuff we we would be having the same conversation over the phone if you and I were looking at this mm-hmm. paper that just came out. Yeah. And then we're trying, we're coming up with hypotheses, you know, at in real time. Yeah. I mean, there's there's ev- there's plenty of evidence out there of specialization of predators that are have similar intelligence levels as coyotes do. Yeah. So it stands to reason that might happen too with them. Like yep. in certain areas, you might have, you know, groups of individuals that tend to hunt for one prey item more than another. Well, and you think about how that might happen. You know, coyotes be bopping around through the woods and finds a hen on a nest, catches it, it's like, okay, that was a great meal, and then it's doing it again, and it happens a second time, and now it's like, wait a minute. If I bebop around through the woods in these particular areas, I find these hens a lot. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing you know, you know, that becomes a behavior associated with that pair of coyotes, and maybe they pass that on to their offspring, and and you could certainly have a group that specialize on something that, Maybe the other coyotes never bebop through the woods in the right way. That's right. Or they got, you know, they found some turtle eggs and now they're turtle specialists, you know, like. <laughs> oh, like yeah. I mean, like that, that happens too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, there's, think about this. I mean, there's areas that have abundant wild pigs and pig remains show up in coyote scats all the time. But how is a, how is a, a coyote pup that grows in an area, up in an area, let's just say, I don't know. I won't throw out a specific, let's just say an area that doesn't have a lot of wild pigs, um, Washington state, <laughs> like how, how often is that coyote pup going to get the opportunity to hunt for that prey item? Right. Yeah. I mean, obviously a, a coyote pup growing up in South Alabama is going to be much more familiar with that prey item where it's likely to encounter them. And when it does encounter them, how it should probably initiate the, the pursuit. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, I think that's a really, really interesting question. And we were talking about it earlier. That is something that we are uh, what we're going to work on as part of the Florida turkey work. We, we've already had coyotes tagged on the same sites as turkeys, and we're planning more work. Hopefully some funding will come through to help us do that with the, some of the, the uh, funding mechanisms. But... I find that really interesting. Yeah. That there could be some individual coyotes that just are turkey eaters. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's not necessarily ubiquitous. Although, I will say, when you look at these scat studies, assuming they're not sampling one individual over and over again, it's probably relatively common that they eat some turkey. Mm -hmm. I think so. And it's probably relatively uncommon that they're eating primarily turkey since... It's yeah. pretty rare to find a scat that's, or you don't find that many that are dominated by a turkey, right? Especially outside of spring. Yeah. Which, like I said, that that's super consistent across these studies that that seems to be when coyotes would get them. And, you know, people out there know if you're a turkey hunter, you put out a decoy and a, a coyote comes in and, tr- you know, tries to stalk it. Like I get sent that a lot. I've seen that happen. Right. I have had turkeys gobbling that they just shut up and I don't know why. And then a few right. minutes later, here's a coyote. Right. Like that, you know, I, I believe that they're, 
well, they're definitely eating some of them, and there may be some individuals that are specializing on them, and it makes a lot of sense if they hear them gobbling and they're hungry and they've had turkey before, they might go see what's going on, see if they can figure out a, an angle. Yeah. And I know another thing that people talk a lot about, it too, is they worry that having lots of coyotes suppresses gobbling activity and makes yeah. it harder to hunt or less enjoyable. I wouldn't be surprised. Stands to yeah. reason. that how, how often is a turkey just gobbling his face off and it doesn't attract the attention of every coyote in the woods? Yeah. And bobcat. And, right. you know, everything else that wants to eat a turkey. Yeah, Including if it me. sees a coyote, it's gonna, <laughs> they're going to quit gobbling just like they do when they see us, you know? Yeah, so it makes sense. But I think one thing that's really important to touch on here, because believe it or not, Marcus, we've been going an hour and 40 minutes almost at this point. Oh, we've got an hour. Huh? So we've still got an hour left? Good. We'll no, go we're on, we've been on an hour. Oh, really? Yeah, hour and six minutes. I've got a counter at the bottom that says 141 for some reason. Hmm. Your counter's off. <laughs> <laughs> it always has been. Um, but there's, t- you know, there's two questions embedded in this. And, and one, right, the one that we've been focusing on the most is what is the extent or the magnitude of the impact? And then the other, of course, is it whether or not we can do anything about it. Yeah. Well, let me address the extent because yeah. that's where I was going. Right. And then... Uh, I think we can go to you for some things about what to do about it because you've worked on that specifically. Yeah, like I said, I've got a whole bunch of things that we'll link, and you can see notes on a whole bunch of specific studies, but the impact on or, or the relative proportion of coyotes in any given study varies substantially. Mm-hmm. And in some cases, it's a you know, high proportion of the tagged individuals and others, it's relatively low, and you can kind of see that whole gamut uh, as I've laid it out in this this uh, post. But since I made that post, there has been another paper come out. Yeah. That is out of Mississippi. This was Guiming Wong, who is a quantitative ecologist that focuses on population ecology and is really keenly interested in predator-prey population dynamics. So, and he's done a fair amount of turkey work in the state mm-hmm. with with uh, Adam Butler and, and others. Mm-hmm. But, uh, actually, fun fact, I worked on this with him a little bit oh, cool. early in the study. Yeah, uh, When I was at Mississippi State, we talked about it and talked about where to get different kinds of data. And I was already sort of thinking about coyotes and how they were influencing turkeys, and he was also. Mm-hmm. But uh, he went on forward with it and, and published this paper just recent. Yeah. And it's Wong et al. 2023, I believe. But we will link it for you. And the the study name is inverse relationship between coyote and wild turkey population time series. Yikes. And then there's actually another sentence worth of that sounds, title. That sounds foreboding. Yeah, so inverse relationship basically means they're negatively correlated. So when one goes up, the other one goes down. And that's precisely what they present in here. Mm-hmm is if you look at figure one in this paper, yeah, as turkey relative abundance, which they quantified as the catch per unit effort. Mm-hmm. That's what if folks are looking at this figure. So like what turkeys, har- means. turkeys harvested per, per hunter, hunter har- days or hours or whatever. Yeah, per hunter effort. That's yeah. right. So how long does it take somebody on average to harvest a turkey? As that went down over time, which has been going, it was going down from the mid-1980s all the way through the early 2000s, which you remember in Mississippi, the low population in Mississippi was in the early 2000s. I wish they would have had another decade of data when that catch per unit effort started going back up. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I don't, I don't think they had the the trapper data. Mm. 
Yeah. I think that's why he wasn't able to do that. They quit collecting the trapper data? I think so. Oh. They had a state level metric yeah. or something, but yeah. the coyote is catch per unit effort as well, where I don't know exactly. I mean, it probably tells you in the study in detail I'm how sure he calculated it's it. But trapper surveys, you know, yeah, some every state sort of, has those where you have to report. Yeah. Yeah. They somehow quantified how much trapping effort right. is going on and how many coyotes are being reported. Yeah. So. These let me be frank about it. They, these are not the strongest data sets. There's a lot of variation, a lot of problems with them. I did confirm that it was from a survey of licensed trappers. Okay. So there's all kinds of reasons to be, you know, have a healthy skepticism. But they do find a pattern where as coyote populations increase, which you can kind of see that that pattern of increase, that, that I think that's probably reflective of coyotes. You know, in that range map when we were showing it, uh, coyotes were showing up in Mississippi in the 60s, right? So by the 80s, they should really be taking hold. Mm -hmm. And you can see, you know, that's sort of where we're starting here in the 80s and uh, you continue to see that population increase and over that same time frame turkey relevance was declining now there's alternative explanations for that this yeah. is just a correlation yeah i mean like for example this starts in 1983 and the num the number of 1983 you know ford pickups on the road has also declined over the time yeah. but that's not why turkeys have been declining yeah. you know <laughs> that's right I mean, property size has, has also been declining. Yeah. Uh, the Acreage planted in pine plantation. Yeah. The number of... Uh, has increased. <laughs> <laughs> the, the number of paved acres in the state has increased substantially, mm -hmm. right? There's all sorts of things that are correlated with this. The it human doesn't, population. It doesn't necessarily mean causation, right? But uh, it was pretty interesting that there seemed to be this pattern. And uh, when they, they actually did detrend it, which basically, as you might imagine, when, when you have this time series like this, yeah, and there's a general trend over time where like a population is declining over time, yeah, well, of course, that's going to be negatively correlated with any population of anything else that's inclining over time. Right. Just because of time. Yeah. They're both being affected yeah. by time. So typically what we do in these studies is look for other independent data sources to con to to see if there's the same pattern there. Yeah, that's one way. He did it mathematically. Of course, because he's way better at it than I am. <laughs> yeah, I don't even... I, frankly, to be honest with you, I can't understand some of the stuff that was going on in here. But I sort of vaguely understand they detrended the year. So in other words, that a lot of the relationship is explained by year. Like, which year are you in? Mm-hmm is explaining a lot of the variation in that data. So he basically took all of that out mathematically so they could see among all the variation not explained by year, how much, like, well, how strong is the relationship? And there was still uh, evidence that they are negatively correlated. So that's better. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, we still need to do work on it. So I guess the the point to me overall is it's also a very it's also a very reasonable you know a reasonable correlation to to expect ex expect right so well, that's what I was I was about yeah. to get at like I don't think it's that unreasonable that coyote populations would affect turkey populations to some degree no I, they're not going to eat all of the turkeys but you know there's some equilibrium met there uh and particularly because all those studies it seems like the one that is vulnerable is hens nesting and that is the, the more concerning part to me like they, you know they don't have to eat that many turkeys to have a relatively large impact when they're eating hens and there's been no diet study that tries to differentiate male from female turkey parts, right? In the scat? Yeah. Not that I'm aware of. Yeah. I guess the closest thing that we would have to that is looking at cause-specific 
mortality rates between tagged males and tagged females to see if one or the we, other is we more probably vulnerable. have that data already yeah. and and uh, we probably well, have we, to amalgamate it from multiple sources yeah. but well the you know the hen mortality rates are more similar to what's reflected in the coyote scat in terms of percentages like having 10 or 15 percent of hens killed by coyotes not that yeah. unusual yeah. whereas with males it's usually a single digit low yeah. single digits yeah so but we've actually we are developing a genetic tool where we'd be able to do this yeah we we're almost there where we can distinguish male and female based on some some genetics magic yeah that'd be super cool one of my colleagues is doing so yeah that's a really cool question but i guess the the point is it, it i think it is reasonable that that they are negatively related and they're definitely eating some turkeys mm-hmm. and if they're eating hens primarily it makes sense that coyotes would affect populations. And we've talked a lot on this show before about um, we've given many reasons why it would be concerning that coyotes are specializing in hens or that yeah. they are, they're disproportionately affecting hens because we've made the case that individual hens can be very important to the productivity of a, po- of a population. Yeah. Of well, think about that locally. You know, at the state level, it may not matter. Yeah. But on your property, yeah. it might. Right. Like if you've got if you've got the coyote pack that specializes on turkeys. Yeah. I know what's happening. The people are out there they're already ordering traps and <laughs> <laughs> so You think uh, so? I do. You so think they needed be- they, you think they get... needed one more reason to make that leap or I feel like no. the ones that were gonna do it already did it. Yeah, and that's fine. I, yeah. I want them to have fun on their property and go enjoy it and try to get stuff done. And, and uh, you know, that means different things to different people. But we're probably not going to make the problem worse. Yeah. As long as you're still tending to other desirable activities. Well, where I've kind of ar- arrived at it, and we can, I mean, if you want to, like I can go into all the data from when we did intensive coyote removals in Georgia and that experiment. I, I do want to like get into that. Yeah, I mean, the Cliff Notes version of it is that um, we trap, we had professional trappers. They trapped two years back to back. Each year they were starting in late winter. So think like right after deer season. And they were trapping all the way up through uh, the end of April. Okay. What were the size of these properties? 5,000 acres each. Okay. No, no, no. 10,000 acres each. I'm not bad. There were 10,000 acres each. There were two wildlife management areas, and they were in the same county. Um, and so we had professional so a scale trappers. At which most people can't operate at. Yeah, we had professionals. Sometimes we had more than one professional trapper on a 10,000-acre property. So sometimes we had two or three guys setting traps, and these are guys that do it, that make their living, that put food on the table trapping, um, not amateurs. And so it was very intensive. It was across a large scale that most landowners can't trap at. And we were effective the first year of trapping on only one of our sites at reducing coyote abundance because we tracked it throughout the the study period using genetic techniques. And we reduced it in the first year of trapping by 80%. But in the second year of trapping, um, use the same trappers, approximately the same number of trap nights, you know, within reason, you know, you're mm-hmm. not exactly the same, but it was, it was the same overall level of effort. And the population of coyotes on that property went back up to where it was statistically no different in terms of abundance than it was before we had ever done any trapping on the site. And then on the other site that was right down the road from it. After two years of that intensive effort. Yeah. You're not, you're not at less coyotes. Yeah, so after year one, our data showed an 80% reduction in yotes, and then we trapped again in year two, but after that, it showed that the population had recovered up up to the point before we had even trapped the first time. (sighs) And then on the other site right down the road, we never influenced coyote abundance whatsoever. It was basically like a straight line throughout the study, even though we were trapping. So basically, even the time point where you saw a dip... May not may not even be real because you maybe not. You got one I, site that there didn't happen at all, and then the yeah. other site it only happened in one of the two years. Yeah, 
But then, Golly, but then, 10, like ten thousand acres with that kind of effort, man. How is that? How is that even a thing? I don't understand it. And that's well, what other... people get mad at me about. It's like I'm not telling you that I that I completely understand what's going on, but that's what the data shows. Yeah. Which is consistent. Yeah. That that you know, go look at the other study that was done at a similar or maybe a lar- even larger magnitude over a longer term for sure. Yeah, so John Kilgo, South Carolina, Savannah River site, he had three eight thousand acre study areas. Yeah. Um, spaced out across 300,000 acres. So they were, they were spatially segregated from each, separated from each other. And um, they did not use like capture mark recapture with genetic techniques like we did to estimate abundance. Um, but they were monitoring fawn survival as a function of removals. And they did three years, I believe, of removals. And they kind of found the same thing if you just watch the the fawn survival numbers, it was like they trapped that first year survival went way up, but then they kept trapping and it kind of just like oscillated like this. Yeah. The, the, well, it was the survival it was, response. Yeah. It was up one year, the same one year and lower one year. That's right. Time. So the net effect was like a modest gain. Yeah. Um, but they experienced a modest gain after trapping an 8,000 acre area with professional trappers yeah. for several months out of the year. I mean, you're talking about, you know, I don't know, thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars that you would have to pay someone to do that. I wonder what the cost per phone or cost per turkey would work out to. Like, you know, assuming there is a modest gain, the the amount of effort, man, was just remarkable in those studies. So I worked that out um, for our study. I did Well, actually, I take that back. I didn't work it out for... um, the fawn gains, but I re- do remember that it was costing us about four hundred dollars per coyote removed. Wow! <laughs> <laughs> so you're you're paying like probably it would probably end up being in like the thousands and thousands of dollars. Per... Yeah, but I mean, a landowner wouldn't pay that. I mean, we were paying we we're paying pros well, to trap really is, large like, acreages. Yeah, you would expect with that kind of effort over that over multiple years that it would just be like a com- like a complete hole in the distribution of coyotes. Yeah, it would be like Turkey Nirvana. <laughs> yeah, and it's like even then you can't even. De- you can't consistently show that there's even less coyotes. Yeah, at, on that kind of scale, that that to me is is frustrating. I don't really understand it, and everybody gets mad at me about it. Yeah, but it is what it is. Yeah, like, like what are we gonna do about it? If like, I really, you can argue really... up and down, but the data, like that, it's not like those y'all y'all botched it up. No, you know you call. I mean, I, I remember Kil- Kilgo's numbers. They literally were removing hundreds of coyotes off of yeah. these areas. Yeah. I, I mean, I'll be honest with you. I was disappointed in our results. <laughs> yeah. I mean. Well, you know, I kind of, in my initial reaction to the study from uh, the Jones Center, with the, they had the, they've got predator exclosures oh, on the site. Good. Yeah. And they actually showed that it financially would make more sense uh, if you were trying to increase phone survival, yeah, to have to have a fence and keep yeah. all of the coyotes outside the fence. I'm so I'm so glad you said that because <laughs> I was about to bring it up. And the way that I was going to phrase it is that if you're if you're really serious about trying to manage coyote predation on your property for deer or turkeys, I think you're better off building a and it doesn't have to be a high fence. You could just build a four foot woven wire fence. Uh, like they did down there at the Jones Center, and they put a hot wire at the bottom and a hot wire at the top yeah. on a solar charger. And, well, the, yeah, it's, and, pretty, and it's pretty dang effective at keeping them out. Yeah, and if you have it where you can ride the fence, so to speak, you, yeah. you can see evidence if they've dug a hole under it or you know if there's one getting in somewhere, mm-hmm. then just you got to stay after it. Yeah, but what was really interesting is um, it wasn't that long ago that – you and wasn't it you and I that we we rode around those predator exclosures? Didn't we do it one time? I don't think we. I've done that, but I don't think I did it with you. 
Oh, I remember what it was. We've both done it independently, but then we, we were talking to Mike Connor about him not that long ago because you and I were thinking about doing some more work out there. Mm-hmm. And he was talking about how the raccoons over time have learned to use uh, branches that overhang the fence. And they've yeah. actually worn the bark off of those branches that are their <laughs> access point to getting into those exclosures. Do you remember him saying something about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. And he said, so we're having to do some limb trimming and stuff like that to shut those down. You just can't win, man. <laughs> well, that you know what this boils down to is nature hates a vacuum. Yeah, that's true. It just fills back in. When you, when you create one, it doesn't matter if it's with habitat, predators, prey, whatever. It's going to fill in with something. Yeah. You know, there have been a whole bunch of studies now where coyotes were tagged and these ridiculously long distance movements. Yeah. Like uh, we had one at Fort Bragg that we tagged in the middle of Fort Bragg and it was like three months later. It was in, it was almost in Washington, D.C. Mm-hmm. It was not like if you track it in the few month period, it had to have walked at a minimum 900 and something miles. Yeah, and what's, prob- what's crazy about that is it was pro- had probably already gone several hundred miles before y'all tagged it. Right. Like, when I, you know, that, then you start to think about why, why would trapping, even at thousands of acre scales, yeah. not work? It's like, well, of course it doesn't work. Yeah. That, and they're covering that in a day. And consistently we see that, you know, somewhere around a third of the coyotes that are tagged in a study kind of move like that. I mean, they may yeah. not move from North Carolina to Washington, D.C., but they might go from, you know, Metro Atlanta, you know, down to Columbus, Georgia, yeah, you know, or somewhere like that. Well, I mean, certainly they may... more than, I mean, it's not even operating at the county scale. Yeah. So unless you're trapping a county, and yeah. even then you're probably not enough. Like, I, I don't want to necessarily discourage everybody from going and doing that but we need to temper expectations like we can't experimentally demonstrate that you're going to get a big Mm -hmm. impact out of it yeah i mean the smallest the smallest home range that i've ever seen from a coyote that i tagged was a female during the breeding season that was only using about five or six hundred acres um and then you know most individuals and especially when you talk about outside of the breeding season you're talking in square miles in terms of the areas that they use, or sometimes, like you said, even counties, mm. like they go back and forth between, you know, Lee Russell and some other county. Yeah. So that, well, that sucks. I mean, it, <laughs> there's no other way to put <laughs> it. it, it but, yeah, it sucks. It sucks for, you know, if you're in terms of trying to control it. Yeah. But, you know, we're, I think we are, moving toward getting better evidence to show that, you know, improving the quality of habitat to escape predation and potentially provide alternatives to to turkeys, you probably have more control over predation at at the scale of your property that way. And uh, if you do them together, great. And, and you know, with some of the nest predators, maybe you can have a bigger impact at the smaller scale. Yeah. Which we covered the one study in Canada that suggested that raccoons respond, like can rebound basically immediately. Mm-hmm. So you're going to have to be consistent. Yeah. But Yeah. Where I arrive at on all this is not to tell anybody one way or another, you know, what they should or shouldn't do, but rather just to, this is information, do with it what you will. Yeah. What I've decided to do with it, I still trap. Um, because there's all these other enjoyable aspects to it for me, just like there are with hunting. Um, but I don't have great expectations that it's changing, you know, making profound changes in deer turkey populations or in my mm-hmm. hunting experience on the property. But that doesn't necessarily take away from my enjoyment of doing it. Right. Yeah, and maybe maybe you, there are some that are specializing and you catch one of them. Sure. Maybe, maybe locally then you do. Yeah. I still think we have a lot of room for work on it, which is why both of us are actively trying to fund work related to predation. Right. Uh, I, I definitely think we have more work to be done, but, you know, don't think that going and setting a few foothold traps is going to solve it. 
because I I just don't think that's a reasonable expectation. I don't think so either. So, especially for a, for a species, you know, like with deer, for example, expecting a positive outcome from I think predator like especially like coyote and bobcat removal with deer um is probably way more reasonable than expecting a positive outcome for turkeys just because of the diversity of the predator community that that preys upon turkeys at different life stages right Mm -hmm. there's just it's like unless unless you have a coyote population that's specializing on nesting hens yeah right it's reasonable to believe that even if you pull coyotes out of that system completely, that you're probably going to have compensation by other predators that are still there. And so then where a lot of people take that is to the natural conclusion of, well, I need to trap everything. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe so. (laughs) A lot of people are doing that. Yeah. And they swear by it. Mm -hmm. You know, we've talked about the, the habitat part of predators probably magnify habitat problems. Yeah. Just like habitat problems could magnify predation. Right. So, you know, if if you're in relatively poor conditions, coyotes could have a larger impact by killing, you know, hens that don't have anywhere good to nest than uh, if it was, if your property was full of good nesting cover. Okay. That's probably right. not an issue then. So, uh, there was one other important point that I had, and I've forgotten it now. So thank you for that. You're welcome. <laughs> I, I, you know, I don't know if this is a helpful point or not, um, but it keeps it keeps popping up in my mind. So I guess I'll say it. But I've been on several properties that have outstanding habitat and no predator control that have tons of turkeys. Yeah, that's true. To be T- totally transparent there's probably a number of other factors that are different between those properties and average properties like the ones i'm thinking of tend to be much larger than the average land holding for example so it's not yeah. i recognize it's not apples to apples but it's possible yeah it's still an anecdote yeah but my experience most of the time when people are really doing jam up job of habitat they're also doing some predator stuff they are yeah and i they're have usually no... doing them in tandem and I have no concerns about that. I don't either. You know, I the one thing that I, I, I do take a little bit of issue with, and maybe this is because I was taught to trap primarily by guys um, that are more old school or traditional in their techniques, is the only thing I don't like about it is I don't like how some people just want to like broadcast trapping out there on social media just because that is something that the general public really, really does not understand. And that yeah. gives me a little bit of pause. Um, but, you know, other than that, like, I just, I don't know. That's Everybody has a right to do what they want to do. But the way that I feel about it is I like to show, when I show trapping, I like to try to show more of, like, the outdoor enjoyment that I get with my family in doing it versus, you know, just showing stacks of dead animals. Of yeah, bl- dead animals, bloody animals, pretty much, yeah. I'm with you on that. I don't think that that's a good idea for us to be broadcasting everywhere i don't want to give the impression that you're torturing animals or something i don't want it taken away i want to keep it as a tool yeah um but then there are you know then a lot of people would counter argue and say you know to me that you know the antis are going to try to take it no matter what so i'm not going to try to hide it but it's not really the the percentage on the tip right the ones that are going to be against no matter what or the ones that are for no matter what it's the ones in the middle that are important like that's the majority of people yeah and uh you you may start losing some of that support when you're showing a bunch of gruesome stuff i mean i don't like looking at it yeah i don't like looking at you know a picture with a hundred thousand raccoons dead in it right so uh one i did come up with my point that I wanted to make. You know, I, I kind of made the point, maybe uh, you trap, maybe in your circumstance, you have a coyote that's specializing on turkeys and you remove it. But based on that logic, you could turn that around. 
like, well, maybe you have a coyote that doesn't like turkeys and you remove it and it allows the door to open for some, another one to come in and start specializing. Mm-hmm. So something to think about. We, we usually don't say both gonna sides leave our, of that coin. <laughs> you're just going to leave our listeners with that. And yeah. you know what? There's something else that I was thinking of um, that you inspired me by sharing that. Then I'll, I'll share this as well is a lot of times, you know, you and I have said stuff like we've never talked to someone who's trapped and said it didn't work. To be completely fair, I've never, I don't, I can't think of an instance where um, someone has told me a story about doing a major habitat improvement and they said it didn't work either. You know, can you think of that? No, the only, the only thing that even similar to that would be food plots. Mm -hmm. Like they, you know, really hated a blend that they planted or it just completely failed or something like that, but. I can't think of one. Well, I think we all, my point there is I think we all look for positive outcomes to the the time that we spend on, you know, yeah. aspects of managing, managing aspects of our property. We want we to see want that to cash payoff. in on our sweat equity. Yeah. We want to think that what we're doing is actually matters, of course, because we spend <laughs> time on it. Right. You know? Yeah. So. All good. right. Well, I think that that's, um, I think that's a lot of good information for people to think about. And if you're frustrated because we didn't leave you with a, with a specific direction to take that information, we did that on purpose. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, people, some people are going to take it and be like, well, this is evidence of why we need to be trapping. And others will be like, well, this is evidence of why we don't need to worry about trapping. And then, you know, I, all I can say is, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what I can say is, that's a pretty well-rounded literature review. So if you want to go look at the papers, that's a large portion of them. Mm-hmm. Like there's probably other stuff. It's not completely comprehensive, but I was trying to find as much good information on it. And here you go. So you can go and look at that and share it and do whatever you want with it. Boom. <laughs> and leave us a rating because we really appreciate it. We want the show to have a bigger reach and be successful. And, you know, we want an opportunity to give you something. Mm-hmm. Do we want to talk about football season? We can start talking each week about, about what happened. Do you want to talk about the that? football season? Maybe I want to talk more about football this week than you do. You probably <laughs> do this year. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, let's be honest. We beat Alabama and A- A&M. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it was a win, buddy. <laughs> An impressive hey, win at that. Hey, last year after dropping one to New Mexico State that, uh, in fact, my, I had my whole family at <laughs> – <laughs> that makes us so horrible i mean i'm not taking anything for granted at all with auburn football <laughs> yeah i did see some projections that florida was was not favored to win five games oh i thought you were gonna say it was not favored to win the national championship no i was like uh, that's probably no, a not, pretty safe that's probably a safe to, bet <laughs> they're not favored to have a five game season yeah so yeah, that's not good. Maybe no, maybe not. it'll be better than that. SEC football is better when Florida's in it, man. Yeah. I like it when it, when we have several really good teams. Yeah. You know, where any given week anything could happen. I think that's part of the the you know, the culture of football in the Southeast. It's, mm-hmm. it's, that's one of the reasons is Got such a competitive conference. It's not any fun when there's only one or two teams that are worth anything. Yeah, that's right. I'm going to go out on a limb, by the way, and say that my alma mater will probably be pretty good again this year. Yeah, I'd <laughs> say that's safe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they got None after. Of mine will be. <laughs> <laughs> they got after Clemson on Saturday. That was, yeah. Yeah, that was good. Well, All right, we're wasting everybody's time now. Well, they can shut it off. <laughs> Is that the strategy? Stop listening. Well, no. we made it. We made it clear that I mean, we at least we didn't interject that in the middle of the episode, so they had to get through it to listen to more turkey. Yeah. It's only the dedicated few now. Yeah, and we appreciate right. you. Yeah, we, we do. do. Do we have a giveaway today? Uh, we do. Okay, what do we got? We have another. Um, Florida camo hat. Florida camo hat. Yeah. Awesome. So, 
I was trying to think through. I think I have more items than that, uh, but this one will be the Florida camo hot. I f- I'm picturing that they sent you a box and you just like look at the top item and you're like, okay, no. well, we'll just give them away like in the order that they were in there. No, no. Uh, they actually did send me a box of hats for gotcha to to give away, and then he did not do that with shirts because they're you know size specific so yeah so he's sending them direct uh, yep yeah but the uh this week will be a hat all right we're ready for that listener yes sir so we've got <laughs> we've got a florida brand camo hat for bearded turkey man nice we Wait, appreciate is that, is that you <laughs> well it could be <laughs> he's giving a hat to himself everybody yeah so bearded turkey man we appreciate you listening and and everything and we appreciate your five star rating and i wanted to read that to everybody all my podcast or whitetail based podcast besides this one oh everything else is about whitetails I'm very interested in doing some turkey management on my farm, and I have learned a lot here. Thanks for what you guys are doing. Keep up the good work. Cool. We appreciate it. Yeah, we appreciate so, that. Yep. Yeah, uh, just reach out to us. We'll be happy to, to get you this hat in the mail. It's a really cool looking hat. Yeah. And uh, as, as another note, uh, make sure that you tune into our habitat management centric episodes because we oftentimes talk about how turkey management principles can accomplish deer objectives too yeah and we even had an episode on deer university i think yeah that was like a shoot that was a while back yeah but that um, was be- yeah that was probably uh two years ago either. right but we've done it <laughs> yeah so get, go check that out <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody, for listening. We really appreciate it. Wild Turkey Science is part of the Natural Resources University Podcast Network and is made possible by Turkeys for Tomorrow, a grassroots organization dedicated to the wild turkey. To learn more about TFT, check out turkeysfortomorrow.org.